John, the book of John, chapter 10. We'll be looking at the first 14 verses of John, chapter 10. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me, came before me, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. And we know that the Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his precious word this morning. Let's open with prayer before we begin. Lord, we ask you at this time to please help me as I attempt to speak your truth, as we look once again into your holy word and we find the great riches that that uh, we need to bring out, but Lord, we find ourselves inadequate to do so. I pray that you would help me to do so in such a way that your name would be exalted above all things this morning. May we have a clear understanding as to your person, your work, and the uh, great concept of the Trinity and the deity of Christ. All of these things, Lord, I pray, may become clear to us. May your Holy Spirit teach us and help us as we Open your word this morning. We rely completely on you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we began the exposition through the Gospel of John. We did not quite finish the first verse. We, uh, were, we went through most of it, and at the end of uh, where the last segment, I would like to return to that and continue a little bit in that. That is John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is the beginning of the first 18 verses of John, which we know as the prologue. This introduces us to the major themes of John's gospel. Now, this is all summed up. We talked about last week in John chapter 20, verse 31, but these things, but but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Last week we began by looking into the term that John used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, the Word, or what we know in the Greek to be the Logos. Now, we talked about this being perhaps an unfamiliar concept to many. In our times, our 21st century mind, we don't focus upon the Logos, as the Greek and Hebrew mind did during the time of John. John didn't have to explain anything here. He just he said, this is the word. He didn't have to explain this. But because of the distance of time and culture, we needed to explain that. And that is that the Logos was to the Greeks the great unknowable reason or influence behind all the design and intelligence of creation. Now, today we are beginning to, to, to fall back, our culture is, slightly in the, with the idea of intelligent design. 
Now, many of these scientists are promoting this, and they do not know the true God. They don't really care to who this particular designer is. They just know there has to be one. Well, this is what the Greeks were, were talking about. Logically, they came to that conclusion that there had to be something behind creation. They couldn't identify it. They didn't have the revelation to identify it, so they called it the Logos. John opens his book by identifying this great mysterious Logos of the Greeks, the Word, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we also mentioned to the Hebrews the Word, the Logos, was the Word of the Lord. This was the demonstration of God's mighty power in creation and in his revelation to man. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Uh, John showed the Jews, the Jewish theologians, that the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is this power or word of God revealed to men. Then we looked into the defining qualities of, of the Logos. We know, as we read, we read John 1, in the beginning. We know that he was there at the beginning. He was not a created being at the beginning. He was the creator at the beginning. He was the pre-existent one already there when this all began. He was there in the drawing room of eternity, putting together, as God put together the plans of, of, of all of the ages. He was there. He was there in the beginning, he was the beginning. He had no beginning. We talked about that, the preexistence of the Logos or the Lord Jesus Christ. We also talked about that he was, this Logos, this Christ, was with God. Now, being with God, he enjoyed face to face fellowship with God, equal to equal fellowship, unknown to any other being other than within the Trinity itself, unknown to the angels. The angels bow before the Father. The Logos stood face to face with the Father. This also talked about the distinction between the Father and the Son, the Logos. They're, though they are together, they are separate individuals. They, they are separate persons because they are with each other. They, they at this point, when I talk about their, their persons, are not the same. However, we went on to describe that the Logos was God as well. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, he's more than all of that. He is God himself. He shares in the divine essence of God. So, we talked about the Trinity. We tried to to bring out the fact that the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity, where you have Christ with God and Christ as God, is something beyond our comprehension. You know, we try to illustrate it by human means. Uh, we, some people use an egg. Some people use the wheel and the spokes of the wheel and the hub, etc. We talked about that. But all of those are inadequate because we cannot begin to fathom the depth of this theological mystery of the Trinity. It's something beyond us. Uh, Isaiah 46 verse 9 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Since there is none like him, we have nothing to compare him to. We have to just accept the fact that the word of God reveals it and that though we cannot begin to understand it or comprehend it, we accept it as truth. Now we left off with that thought and John takes that last thought and expands upon it in the next several verses and we'll be getting to that. This is the concept that all must accept and believe if they are to have eternal life. That is, you must accept the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is divinity. He was with God in the beginning and He was God. So this is something <clears throat> that we are required to believe if we are to have eternal life. John eight twenty four, <clears throat> Jesus said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. If we do not believe that Jesus Christ is this Logos, this great reason before time with the Father and God himself, then we will die in our sins. Now, before leaving this passage, I wanted to bring out a few things of a practical nature for us because we may face this in the future if we, already, if we haven't already. And this may be of a help to us. I mentioned last week 
<clears throat> that this passage and this entire Gospel of John is devastating to the cults. Now, the cults, their, <clears throat> their main focus is somehow confusing the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the person of the Trinity, the person of the Father. All of this they want to confuse and muddle because behind the cults, you have the author being Satan. So he is working to confuse us about the Lord Jesus Christ and about who he was and the fact that he is God. Now, that being the case, they look at the Gospel of John and they say, well, we, it's obvious. What do we do? We, they have to try to explain it away. And the word was God. There's just simply no way to get around it. Now, the only way to do that is to twist it and to destroy it. Now, before we leave this part of the verse, this is, I'd like to bring out uh, something regarding the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, all of us have had some of them at our door. To, they usually come in pairs. Sometimes it might be with uh, a parent with a child. Uh, sometimes they may come individually. They come to our door, and their desire is to tell us about a future paradise that we all ought to, to strive to get into. Now, my, one came to my stepfather's place. He was with us this past uh, weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday, actually last week. He said they came up to his, his door and started walking up the yard. He saw who they were, and he came out to, to talk to them. He said, I'll tell you what, I, he knew who they were. He said, if you can tell me how I can get to heaven, I'll talk to you. And they, no, we can't tell you that. He said, well, I don't have time to talk to you, then go away. And what he meant by that was he knew that they're not going to tell you about heaven. There's only 144,000 people, according to them, going to heaven, and the rest are going to be confined to, to the earth, the paradise of earth, so, so they say. But they have a lot of other doctrines. And whenever they come to the door, I don't focus upon their eschatology, what they believe in future things, or their blood transfusion issues, or uh, what, these other issues that they may have. I focus on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the whole crux of the issue. Who is Jesus? If they don't have this right, there's no use of discussing anything else with them. And the most insidious doctrine that they bring is the blatant denial of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. They hold to a variation of what we call Arianism. Arianism goes way back to the 4th century in the church. There was a great controversy. They, there was a group of fellow by the name of Arius denied that Christ was God, that, that he was a creation of God and that he was not to be worshipped or to be considered equal with God. And this was a great danger to the church. And the Ar Arian sec section, this cult, actually took over a good bit of the, 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 the churches and caused a great rift in the church and persecution of the true church at one time. And it kind of fades in and out of history. It's, it's gone, it comes back. You see it in Unitarianism. You see it uh, in different degrees in, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. But they, do not, they believe that Jesus is not God. He's a creation of God. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was Michael the archangel in, as, when it comes to heavenly things. And when he came down to earth, he became Jesus. He's a spirit being of some sort. He is not God himself. So when you see this passage here, where it says the word was with God and the word was God, that, that creates quite a dilemma for them. So what they have done is that they have altered this passage. Now I have a copy of their Bible. It's called the New World Translation. This came out the same year that I did, in 1961. Hopefully I'll have a better impact on the world than, than this will. But uh, they have here, in the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That is, he was a lowercase God. So they, rather than try to explain and, uh, uh, their way around this, Unitarians, however, have ways of explaining this without changing the, the Bible. For one thing, they don't accept much of the Scripture, but Jehovah's Witnesses went as far as creating their own translation to get around this. Now, this translation is wrong. However, rather than go over all of our heads trying to get into the, the ins and outs of, of, the, of the translators, which I'm frankly, I'm not able to do that, I'd like to look at some of the, the basics. 
Now what they point out, what the Jehovah's Witnesses will point out here, if you show them this verse, you say, wait a minute, you're telling me Jesus isn't God. Well, the Bible says here that in the beginning was the Word. If you go back to, to look down to verse 14 of John chapter 1, it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's obvious that John is talking about Jesus Christ. The Bible, or the, the, the first verse of John says the Word was with God and the Word was God. You show that to them, they're going to say, wait a minute, in the Greek there is no definite article before God. There's no the before God. Now, whenever you have that, then you can put a there instead of the, and then it's not talking about the true God, but some divine being of some sort. So that's how they get around that. And they'll say, hey, that's what it says in the Greek. However, most of them have no idea what the Greek says. They are simply parroting what they've been told from headquarters. And the people at headquarters know very little of the Greek as well. Their founder was Charles Taze Russell. This is back in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, this fellow was causing all kinds of ruckus in the church. Scandals, uh, financial scandals, marital scandals were going on. Uh, somebody exposed him in a pamphlet. Now, all they did in this pamphlet was quote a newspaper that this fellow uh, involved in certain scandals, and he didn't even know the Greek. He was not trained in Greek, but he's trying to tell us what the Greek says. Well, Russell was upset about that, and he took this individual to court and tried to sue him. Well, the defense put him on the stand, put Russell on the stand, and they asked him the question, do you know the Greek? He said, oh, yes. He was handed a Greek New Testament, and on page 447 was the Greek alphabet. And this defense lawyer, as lawyers will do, they're very adept at this, why don't you read for us the Greek alphabet? Very simple, basic, that as far as once you've had a little bit of Greek, that's the first thing you learn. He looked at that, and he couldn't, he couldn't tell one letter of the Greek alphabet. So he asked again, the lawyer said, are you familiar with the Greek language? And under oath... Russell was for, forced to admit no. And what this organization has done is produce their own Bible, New Testament, without very, with very, very little knowledge of the Greek. And that's what they came up. But they claim, they, they're claiming to be Greek scholars, and they say that this should say the word was a god. Well, there are certain problems with that, and we'll look into that just briefly because I, I want to move on. But first of all, the reason that John 1.1 1, 1 reads this way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, is that it is simple and basic and undeniable. Regardless of who the translator is, if the translator is honest about the language, that's what he's going to come up with. Uh, we, we talked about this last week. You take the top 20 translations of the English Bible, the English New Testament, and this is almost word for word. Uh, King James Version, New King James Version, uh, English Standard Version, the NIV, the Common English Bible, the RSV, even the Douay Reims Version, the Roman Catholic Bible, uh, the, the liberals themselves and whatever version they come up with, if they're honest with the translation, they come up with it too because it's simple and basic in the Greek language. There's just no arguing that the construction is exactly what it says. And it's been that way for the past 500 years of Greek scholarship. There's been no issue until the Jehovah's Witness come around and say, oh, yes, but there is an issue. But there's a problem with that with the Jehovah's Witnesses. They say, well, it has to say that because the Greek, the way the Greeks constructed, but they don't believe it themselves. If you, well, I have here, if you look at John chapter 1, if you, if you would, we'll look at a couple verses. I just want to show you this. You can also show this to the Jehovah's Witness. John 1.1, 1, 1, they say that in the beginning was the Word, or the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Hey, it has to be that way because of the construction, so they say. However, you go down to John chapter 1, verse 6. In our Bible, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. You have the same Greek construction here. In other words, what it should say is, there was a man sent from a God whose name was John. What does Jehovah's Witness Bible say? There was a man, or there arose a man, that was sent forth as a representative of God, capital G. Wait a minute. 
If the Greek construction demands that we put a God there, then why did you do it here? Why didn't you just put a God? Well, look down to verse 11. He came... I'm sorry, it's not verse 11. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe on his name. You have the very same construction there. It should say, according to this thinking of the Jehovah's Witnesses, it should say, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of a God to those who believe in his name. What do they have? However, as many as did receive him to them, he gave authority to become God's children. They didn't follow it there. Why? Look down to verse 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Well, you know what's coming. And they were born not from blood or from a fleshly will or from man's will, but from God. The Greek construction, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, should also read from a God. And it could, I mean, the whole way through the Gospel of John, you can do this. You know, there's others. There's also John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. That's the same Greek construction. They, have, they put in their translation, no man has seen God. It should say, no man has seen a God, according to their argument. So they don't follow their own, their own argument. And don't be intimidated when they come to your door and say, wait a minute, the Greek says this. No, the Greek doesn't say that. And you could use those verses and say, well, the Greek says the same thing here. Why does your Bible not translate it the same as you did in John chapter 1, verse 1? So you get the picture. And thirdly, there's a multitude of other scriptures that recognize Christ as God. We don't have to just rely on this one verse, John 1.1, 1, 1, which I think would be sufficient, but everything else in the scripture backs it up. And one of the things that I do when they come to the door, when, like I said, we focus on who Jesus is, all the other stuff I don't have time to mess with, but I tell them, what about the Old Testament passages that talk about Jehovah but use the same description for Christ. We have uh, Isaiah chapter 43. If you want to write these down, you could use these as well. It says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Well, you could ask the Jehovah's Witness, who are we talking about here? They would say Jehovah. Well then, John 1, 49, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus Christ is king of Israel. Jehovah was called king of Israel. What about the Almighty? And there's a lot of them. I have here, I thought we had some in the back, but I noticed they're all out. We'll try to print up some more. This is a brief Bible study for Jehovah's Witnesses. If you give this to a Jehovah's Witness, they won't read it. But what you can do is mark down the passages and use it when you discuss it with them. But this has a whole list of these things in here. Uh, the Almighty. We have Gen- Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Revelation 1 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, they'll say, And the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, that's talking about Jehovah there. Well, I don't think so, because if you get down to verse 18, he described himself as the one who lives and was dead. It's talking about Jesus Christ. Jehovah is the Almighty God. The New Testament tells us Jesus is the Almighty as well. Every knee shall bow to Jehovah. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to every, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. That's the Jehovah of the Old Testament. However, the New Testament tells us of the word, the Lord Jesus Christ in Philippians chapter two and verse 10. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. We know from the scripture from the Old Testament, Jehovah does not share his glory with another. There's no room for any other gods, he says. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. And he repeats Isaiah 48 and verse 11. That was 42, verse 8. 48, verse 11 says, I will not give my glory to another. What does the New Testament tell us? John 5, 23 says, Jesus said that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Is it permissible for me as a Christian, as a believer, to give glory to any other being, the same glory to God as I would an angel? That's what they say that that Jesus is. He's an exalted angel. He's Michael the archangel. Is it possible for me to do that? If I do so, I'm blaspheming. We give glory only, only to God. However, Jesus said, you can honor me exactly the same way you honor the Father, Jehovah. John, John 17, verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus prays to the Father, Lord, Glorify me now with the same glory that we shared. But Jehovah will not share his glory with another. What's the the explanation for this? John 1 1. The Word was God. So we could go on. As I mentioned, this pamphlet has many other examples of that. We'll try to get this reprinted and put out on the table for you. I have to find my computer program. Uh, that has that. So all of this this is nonsense when it comes to their argument. Now, the reason they do this, there's only two reasons that Jehovah's Witnesses will come to your door and try to tell you that Jesus is not God based on John 1.1. One, one. one is that they are deceived themselves. Uh, they've been taught that. Uh, they, they believe that, that hey, uh, it's, it's blasphemy to try to worship Jesus, so I've got to tell other people. They may sincerely believe that. When it goes higher up in the system, though, I believe that they know that they are purposely deceiving. They are antichrists. And that's why they're trying to bring this message from hell to us. So we, we don't consider the individual Jehovah's Witness our enemy. However, the system we oppose as the system of Satan. So then moving on, I'm sorry about taking a little bit more time there. We'll take a, a few minutes to move on further down the passage. Let's look to John chapter 1, verse 2. <clears throat> go back to one we'll just read them together in the beginning was the word the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God so what John does here is that he is now repeating an emphasis of Christ's deity he's re-emphasizing two points of one one and what he's going to do then after that He's going to take the third point that we've been explaining some more, and he's going to go into more detail. We'll get into that. The first, first one is that he was, or the same was, or this is the one, this word is the one who was in the beginning. Before he moves on, he said, I want to reemphasize this. The word, Jesus Christ, was in the beginning. Secondly, with God. His, he was in eternity in fellowship with him. And he's distinct from him. And this, of course, we talked about last week, pointed to Proverbs 8, where we have wisdom claiming to have been the creator's master workman and wisdom personifying Jesus Christ. So he wanted to reemphasize that. And then he moves on to the next point, verse 3. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. We, We move on now to another divine attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the beginning. He was with God. He was God. And now we find that he is the creator of all things. This is given to us in both the positive and the negative sense. Now, the reason this is done is to reemphasize the point twice. So this is important. Listen to this. All things were made 
through him. We find Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, that he made the world, that God made the world through the Son. Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Now, that's interesting. What do we mean by that? Visible, things you can see, all things. So we, we look at all the, 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 the world around us, the mountains, the valleys, the, the trees, the grass, the animals, all of that. Anything you can see visibly was made by him. But not only that, but the invisible. What do we mean by the invisible? The forces and powers which govern the natural world. You think of the, the idea of gravity. Well, where did that come from? Where if I drop something, it falls to the ground. That's a force. God made that force. You think of electricity, the lightnings which we see, and what we're able to harness, the power that though you can't see it, you turn a switch and light appears. Or something, we see the fans here moving. Labor is produced by something that we cannot see, this force. All of these things were created by Jesus Christ. And we also know that through the Scriptures, when we find creation being discussed, It is always attributed to God the Father, to Jehovah. He is the creator. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 45, verse 12, I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded. We know that from this passage that the great power, the great worker behind all this was the Word, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. By going through this, we destroy, the the Gospel of John destroys two heresies. The one we've talked about, that Christ is a creation. He's the firstborn creation of God, but that's it. He's just something that God made. And then after that, God used him to make the world. So there's nothing in the Bible that says that at all. That's one of the heresies. The others is that the angels had a part of creation. There's nothing about that in the scripture as well. It is Jehovah God through the word that made the, all, that there, all that there is. He is the great creator. And then look to verse 4. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I wanted to also emphasize all things were made through him. That is all that we can see. And then it says... And without him, nothing was made that was made. And one, one small minor point, I, well, we call it that, it's because we're going through it quickly, was that if it was created, he did it. It says without him, nothing was made. If it doesn't exist, it's because he didn't make it. That's what it, is what John is saying. He was there, he did it all, and if it's not done, it's because he didn't do it. The Word is the Creator. Also, verse 4, then we'll move on. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him, in the word, was life. He, Jesus Christ, the great Logos, the word, is the source of life. This is one of the greatest, it is perhaps the greatest mystery of the universe. Men have always desired to cast off any authority of God away from their lives. They want nothing to do with the great creator because he tells them how to live their lives. They are responsible to him. So they try to deny him. They try to get rid of him. But that leaves them in a dilemma. They have to explain, how did I get here? Where does life come from? What is the source of life? Well, they're still trying. They're still trying to get to it. There was an interesting debate some time ago between Ken Ham of the Creation Museum and Bill Nye, we know him as the science guy. I used to really enjoy his programs when he talked about science. For the most part, they were very good. But Bill Nye denies the creator. He believes that we all evolved from evolution. The question came up about the origin of life. Where does life come from? Bill Nye really didn't have an answer. We're trying. We haven't found the answer yet, but we will. And Ken Ham just looked at him and said, I have the answer right here. There is a book that tells us that. That is the only place we'll find the answer. Because life is something that's beyond science. Science continually continually finds itself baffled. They know that there's energy in life, but life is more than energy. 
You know, you, you've seen the old movies with Frankenstein where they hook up the electrodes to the dead body, they put the body back together, you know, and they put the brain in, and they put all the electrodes on, and they get the lightning, you know, the lightning's going, all of a sudden it strikes, and the power comes down, and, and the thing stands up, you know. And what's a guy say? He's alive! He's alive! You know? you know, we've all seen that one way or another. Well, what's the problem with that? You can take a, a body, you hook up electrodes to it, you can zap it, but what it's going to do? It's going to bounce around. That's it. There's no life. Life is more than energy. Science can't comprehend that. They can't get to the bottom of it. Well, we, we can see, we, we know that uh, electricity, there's electricity in us. Our neur- our, in our, our brain, our neuro- neurons are firing and, and our body is sending messages to the, uh, or our brain is sending messages to other parts of our body through electrical signals. We know all that. But we can't come to the bottom of exactly what life is. Life is more than energy. Life is also self-awareness. I know that I exist. And I am going to try to maintain my existence as best I can. I'm going to avoid danger. I'm going to eat. I'm going to drink. I'm going to maintain my life because I care about me. I am somebody. I am something. I, I know I'm here. All living things have some sort of awareness of that. Now we, I had a bird get in the attic. Well, actually, uh, he was into the, the fan. My uh, vent, the, my fan vent is too high for me to reach. My ladder, the, the cheap plastic thing blew off, and the, the bird found, hey, I can get in there and build a nest. So we're turning the fan on in the bathroom, and nothing's happening. The steam is still staying in the bathroom. And I put my hand up, and the fan is blowing in instead of sucking the stuff out. Well, a bird got in there. Well, went up to the attic, and any time the attic door opens, Alistair the cat, he comes with me because he knows there's all kinds of goodies up there for him, mainly birds and stuff get in. So we're up there, and he's standing beside me on one side. I take this thing apart, and lo and behold, it, there's a nest in there, and I get out of the, uh, the vent. I knock all this stuff out, and this bird decide, he decides, I've got to get back into my nest. So the bird jumps in up to the, he looks at me, but Alistair's standing there and takes a swipe at him. Well, the bird backed up and took off and kept trying to come back and Alistair waits. The bird knew he existed, or she, probably she, and wanted to preserve that life. There was something there. There was energy there. The bird can fly back and forth. Uh, The bird's uh, bodily functions were working, but it also had something about it which we define as life. And that is it had self-awareness. And science can't comprehend that. They can't can't come to the bottom of it. Then there's a reason for that. Because life is not only energy, it's spiritual. And the word used here in verse 4, in him was life. The word is not bios, where we get the word biology, but it's zoe. And that tends more towards a spiritual description of life. That is, life has a spiritual element which we cannot explain. You know, and, and, and we have all had loved ones that have passed away. We know that they're, that they're gone, that their, their existence left us. There's something about them, their presence is gone, but we still think of them as who they are. Because we know, instinctively, we know that they have not simply vaporized into nothing. We know that because... We're, that's revealed to us in the word of God. But there's more than that. I think men, even pagan people, know there's something beyond. You, know, uh, you go into the past and you see these, gra- these, these uh, graves that they put together. Sometimes people dig them up and ar- archaeologists find them. And they find all these things in the grave. Why was it put there? For their benefit for the next life. Even though they didn't have the revelation of the word, they still knew instinctively because of this life that has been implanted by God. The word is the source of life. And this life is the light of all men. Verse 4. And the life was the light of men. Look to John chapter 5, verse 24. Turn just a few pages over. John 5 and verse 24. We'll look down to verse 26, 24 through 26. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Now what do we mean by that? This is what John's getting at. Christ is the source of life. He's, he doesn't just have life like us. I have life. I'm not the source of life. I cannot reach out to a dead body and give life to that body. Christ can because he is the source of life. And this life, this life essence that he has is the light of men. This light brings illumination. We're, we're not going to go very far here because I want to continue on this thought. We're getting down to John the Baptist and whatnot being the messenger of, of the light and so on. But this light, the, the word itself, himself, is the source of life and the source of truth. When we look at the light here, we're not talking necessarily about physical light, but physical light is here to picture us what's going on. The world is dark spiritually in a moral sense. Very, very dark. Christ comes as life. A life-giving spirit. Spiritual life. And when he comes, what comes with him is the truth. In this dark moral world. And this world then is lightened by that. Men are indebted to Christ who provides the wisdom to understand the natural world, that is, the great discoveries of science and medicine. But as well, he also opens up their eyes, sheds light on the spiritual world. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What happened? This word, we find verse 14 of John chapter 1, enters the world. And what we have here, if you can picture a blazing meteorite coming down, hitting the ground, and just illuminating the entire earth, is what's pictured. The light came into the darkness, the dark, spiritual, dark, moral, dark world, and overcame the world. It says here, verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. And that word comprehend, we may come back to this next week because we're about out of time. This word comprehend doesn't mean just simply understand, but it also means apprehend or overcome. It's, it's one of those words that it depends on the context is how you define it. And we could put here, and the darkness could not put it out. What happened when Jesus came? The darkness of the world knew what was happening. Satan stirred up his minions. They came in and they tried to destroy him before he was ever born. You look down through the history of Israel. The, he, Satan tried to snuff out the light. Tried to snuff out the light. The light is born in Bethlehem. Satan comes in tries with Herod to snuff out the light. He could not do so time and time and time again. And finally on the cross, when you think the life or that the light is being snuffed out, what happens? It's put out. Darkness comes over all the earth, but it's only for a short time because then you have the resurrection, the great power of the resurrection, and Satan is completely destroyed, and darkness is completely overwhelmed by the light of the Word. Jesus made his entrance into the world. All the powers of darkness, men and demons, conspired together to snuff it out, but they could not. With that in mind, let us close with this verse, John chapter 12, verse 46. Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And that is the great promise we have. For any of you who may be abiding in confusion and moral darkness, here is your answer. He is the light. Come to Jesus and you will experience the light of life. Let us bow for